Yeah, so uh, today's lecture will be on the approach to diabetes. It's a huge topic and completely impossible to cover in one hour. So I thought I'll focus mainly on the current ADA guidelines, the 2023 ADA guidelines. So we'll just go through that. Um, some things uh, are new, some things uh, might not be applicable to us, but I'll just go through the ADA guidelines and we'll discuss that as we go through it. So diabetes mellitus, according to the latest guidelines, is uh, classified into these types. So one is type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes. And uh, the third category is specific types of diabetes, which are of other causes. In this uh, come all your monogenic uh, diabetic syndromes like Modi, then diseases of exocrine pancreas, drug or chemical induced diabetes, all these come under specific type of diabetes. And finally, gestational diabetes mellitus. So, Type 1 diabetes, um, so this uh, can be staged as stage 1, stage 2, stage 3. Uh, so stage 1, you have the antibodies which are positive, but your sugars are completely normal. So there's no impact glucose tolerance or impact fasting glucose. So here the characteristics are there is autoimmunity, there is normoglycemia, and they are pre-symptomatic. Stage 2 is your antibodies are present but there is associated dysglycemia. So that is your uh, sugars. Uh, you have uh, either impact fasting glucose or impact glucose tolerance. And here they are pre-symptomatic. So there is autoimmunity, dysglycemia and pre-symptomatic. In stage three, the autoantibodies may be absent. Uh, so, uh, uh, but there is overt hyperglycemia and these people are symptomatic. So they are diabetic by standard criteria. So these are the three stages of type one diabetes mellitus. We look to uh, how do you diagnose diabetes mellitus? So the diagnostic criteria says you need either a fasting glucose, which is more than 126 milligram per deciliter. So fasting is defined as not taking any caloric intake for eight hours. So ensure that fasting is actual fasting. Um, or a two hour postprandial glucose levels of more than 200. So according to WHO, this postprandial should be equivalent of 75 grams of anhydrous glucose intake. So uh, that is the gold standard, how you calculate the postprandial or an HbA1c more than 6.5 or a patient who's coming in a hyperglycemic crisis like a DK or uh, you know, with the plasma glucose more than 200. So any of these four criteria, if you have, you'll call them diabetic. When you, how do you, to call someone pre-diabetic. So pre-diabetic, you have either impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance. Impaired fasting glucose is the glucose levels between 100 to 125. And impaired glucose tolerance is uh, glucose levels between 140 to 199. Or an HbA1c of 5.7 to 6.4. So when you're interpreting HbA1c, there are some conditions you need to keep in mind. So you cannot blindly use HbA1c for everyone. There are some things which you keep at the back of your mind if they have any hemoglobinopathies or if they have a very high RBC turnover, like a hemolytic uh, anemia, if they have G6PD deficiency in pregnancy, when there is fetal hemoglobin also coming into the picture, if they are on hemodialysis, if they have received a recent blood transfusion, or if they have received erythropoietin therapy, HIV patients with uh, protease uh, inhibitors or NRTI therapy, or someone with a very severe iron deficiency anemia. So in these conditions, you will interpret your HbA1c with little caution. And uh, for immune-mediated diabetes, the antibodies uh, which you normally check for are uh, GAD antibodies, islet cell antibodies, and zinc transport rate antibodies. So if a patient comes to you, who, will you screen everyone for diabetes? Who are the patients you will screen for diabetes? So anyone with a BMI of more than 23 uh, kg per meter square, with any one of the following risk factors. If they have a first degree relative with diabetes, um, Indians are a high risk race. So uh, Indian race, high history of uh, any uh, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, either an HDL uh, less than 35 or triglycerides more than 250, history of PCOD, physically uh, inactive people, and features of insulin resistance such as acanthosis, nigricans, or severe obesity. Um, in patients such as this, you, are, you will screen with HbA1c yearly. Uh, patients who had history of gestational diabetes mellitus, 
they are at a very high risk of developing type 2 diabetes later on in their life. So every three years, you screen with HPA1C. <coughs> and this is for everyone after 35 years of age. And patients who have HIV, you will do a diabetic screening in patients with HIV. So they have this uh, nice... Uh, mm, <coughs> It's like a checklist kind of thing, which you can also use for your patients. So it includes things like how old are you, um, 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 your gender, uh, history of gestational diabetes, family history of diabetes, blood pressure, uh, any physical, uh, how physically active or not, weight category. And this weight category comes from this chart. So if the score is more than five, you will need to screen for diabetes. In that. This is a simple, just a uh, one-page thing which you can use to decide who to screen for diabetes. And uh, gestational diabetes uh, diagnosis, uh, we use the 75 gram uh, OGTT, where uh, at 24 to 28 weeks, um, you give a 75 gram glucose uh, challenge. And uh, if the fasting is more than 92, one hour more than 180 or two hours more than 153, you will term them gestational diabetes. So in people who have a high risk for developing this uh, diabetes mellitus, are there any preventive strategies which you can use? And um, so if you have um, high risk of diabetes, such as obesity, strong family history, previous history of gestational diabetes, uh, high risk areas, so you can use something called diabetes prevention program, which includes intense lifestyle behavior. You should have at least uh, 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity uh, every week. And uh, for patients who are overweight or obese, you have to target 7% reduction in the weight. And this can be done by a reduced calorie meal plan. So you calculate the daily calorie intake and you subtract 500 to 1000, depending on that BMI to target the ideal weight. So this can be brought in with uh, diet and ensure in the diet, they focus more on um, um, whole grains, uh, whole food rather than refined food. And uh, DASH diet also has been shown to be beneficial here. In recent times, there's a lot of this uh, technological advances, uh, devices which you can use to monitor activity, nutrition. Uh, um, so there are a lot of smartphone-based apps, uh, the smartwatches, um, telehealth programs, which can monitor activity. Um, and those can be used to um, monitor as well as as an incentive uh, incentive for activity in these patients. Medications wise uh, to prevent diabetes in someone with high risk of diabetes in someone who has pre diabetes and is obese and as overweight, you can use metformin, not for someone who's not diabetic but for pre diabetes. That is impaired fasting glucose and impaired glucose type. Some drugs have shown some minimal benefit like valsartan and vitamin D. Ramipril has not shown to be of any benefit. Statin, prolonged statin use has been associated with increased risk of developing diabetes. That also you need to keep in mind. So if a patient comes to you for with you or you have diagnosed someone to have diabetes, what are the medical evaluation for comorbidities which you'll do? So one is the history-wise, uh, what is the characteristic of the diabetes? In, in which category does it come, whether it's type 2, type 1, whether it's a monogenic, whether it is uh, as, uh, secondary to exocrine insufficiency, those things you will look at. If the patient already has been diagnosed to be diabetic, you will review what all medicines he is already on, what is the response to the medicines, and what all treatments has he gone. Are there any previous complications, any previous hospitalizations for diabetes? And any family history of diabetes, family history of autoimmune diseases. You look for the comorbidities such as uh, hypertension, dyslipidemia, uh, NAFLD, OSA, any hemoglobin impotence or anemia to make a call regarding whether you will use HPA1C or ACPC and look for microvascular and macrovascular complications. We'll also look at the behavioral patterns. What is the diet? How is the physical activity? Stress, sleep pattern, smoking, use alcohol use. We'll look at those. And uh, if looking at the current medications, you'll see what is the current medication plan, whether they are missing doses, uh, whether they are able to tolerate the medications, do they have any side effects, do they have any intolerance to the medications. And one important thing is to ask whether they are taking any alternative medicines along with that. And uh, also vaccination history. 
uh, it's also good to ask them about their technological familiarity. If someone is uh, well versed with technology, you can suggest them the smartphone based apps or uh, smart smartwatch based apps to uh, monitor the other thing. This also helps you planning regarding things like a uh, glucometer based SMBG uh, so that you have an idea saying how uh, technologically uh, uh, well versed they are. And you identify the social structure, um, uh, social support systems. Um, if there's a person living alone and eating outside in hotel every day and you give them a fancy diabetic diet, you know that they're not going to follow it because their social structure does not exist for them. And in case of any complications, who is the surrogate decision maker? So that decision also you take of that time itself and the social determinants of health for them. Uh, look at their economic status, social status, whether yeah, if you're giving a really expensive medicine to them, whether they will be able to afford it or not, those things. And on examination, you look at the uh, blood pressures, peripheral pulses, uh, you look for the B, uh, measure the BMI, check for the thyroid uh, swelling, do a fundus examination to look for diabetic retinopathy. On general examination, you look for xanth uh, acanthosis and agricans, xanthalisma, whether there are any callosities on the feet, any ingrown toenails, any ulcers. And you do a peripheral neuropathy screening with a 10 gram monofilament. You also look for vibration, pain, and uh, reflexes. Uh, the, this thing should also include a screening for depression and uh, eating disorders. When they come for the first visit, the lab investigation should send us the HPA1C, a lipid profile. You look for the, the protein urea evaluation, either a UP by UC or urine albumin by UC. Creatinine and calculate the GFR, thyroid function test. And if they are on ACRB, you'll also check the potassium with that. If they're on a long-term vitamin B12 and have features of B, uh, uh, long-term metformin therapy, you'll also can consider screening them for vitamin B12 deficiency. And every follow-up visit they come, you look for whether they have any hypoglycemia, unawareness, um, any change in the medical history or family history. So when you first meet them, they might say that uh, uh, no family history of a stroke or MI, but the next time you meet them, might have some event happened. So the family history becomes positive. So you'll check for that. Whether they are adherent with the diet or not, look at the physical activity, the sleep, review the current medication uh, plan, uh, see if they are compliant on the medications or not, uh, whether they have any intolerance or side effects to those medications, any alternative medicines uh, have they started taking, and if they are maintaining a self-monitored blood glucose level, you look at the diary and check the glucose levels. Uh, BMI, blood pressure, foot examination should happen at every uh, follow-up visit, and HbA1c and ACPC at every visit. Once a year, you need to screen them for uh, micro and macrovascular complications, which includes an eye evaluation. You need to reassess the diet plan once a year. Uh, substance use, smoking, alcohol history once a year. Social supports and social determinants once a year. And uh, once a year, uh, also needs screening for peripheral neuropathy, uh, fundus examination. Um, and the, once a year, you need to check uh, HPA1C, ACPC every visit, but once a year, you need to check for lipid profile. Uh, uh, ECG, uh, creatinine GFR, and uh, U, uh, UP by UC, and potassium if they are on ACR. So, this is just a graph uh, picture showing the various. Um, uh, it's basically the glycemic management is very person centric, uh, the patient centric in this current uh, guidelines. So, what are the individual's priorities? What is the current lifestyle? Uh, what are the clinical characteristics? Um, depression, motivation, all those things you look at and look at the social determinants of them and see how each of these affect their adherence or their glycemic control. Um, you will also see whether they're, I will come to that, whether they're motivated, not motivated, how your HPMC targets changes with that. And you make a shared decision plan with the doctor, with the patient, you come together saying, what are your priorities? Um, your priorities are a very strict uh, glycemic control or your priorities are a very uncomplicated regimen. So those things you sit together with the patient and make a, a plan regarding that. And whatever management plans, this, uh, this thing for uh, objective, this thing was smart. It should be uh, specific, measurable, achievable, reliable, realistic, and time limited. So all your, the plan you make with your uh, patient should be smart. Uh, you should not make some weight plan in the air. It should be something which you can measure the next time the patient comes to you. And you implement the management plan, provide support for following the plan, 
and then review and agree on this plan. And once they come for review, you follow up on this plan, saying whether they're sticking to it or not sticking to it. This is uh, a graph showing the uh, this thing about um, physical activity and exercise. Ensure that at least 150 minutes a week of moderate uh, to uh, severe intensity of physical activity. If they're doing vigorous activity, 75 minutes a week, moderate intensity, 150 minutes a week. There can be a lot of physical frailty associated with diabetes. So your energy, your strength, your motivation, it's pushed back by at least 10 years compared to someone who doesn't have diabetes. So you feel much, you feel frailer by 10 years in long-standing diabetes. So that you need to keep in mind when you are giving physical activity exercises. And uh, uh, focus on uh, resistance exercises and strengthening exercises in these patients. Tai Chi yoga have also been shown to be beneficial in diabetes. Another important thing uh, is sleep. So sleeping for more than eight hours or less than six hours, both of them are not uh, good in diabetes. Six to eight hours would be the ideal time. So more than eight hours or less than six hours, both are bad. Uh, quality of sleep also uh, plays a role. Um, if they have OSA, if they have poor sleep uh, 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 pattern, if they have to wake up multiple times in the night to go to uh, the washroom, those are and can affect the glycemic control as well. Looking at the chronotypes, they found out that people who are early risers, the um, so what is the early births, have are better compared to night owls in terms of glycemic control and uh, the. Uh, poor, basically people who go to sleep late have poorer glycemic control compared to people who wake up early. So that's a chronotype, uh, cannot be changed, uh, uh, but this is something which they have found. It's just the same thing in the uh, graph form. So sitting uh, prolonged, every 30 minutes you need to, if you're sitting for more than 30 minutes, you need to get up, walk and come back. So that itself has shown to decrease um, uh, uh, insulin resistance and uh, uh, glucose levels. The stepping has shown to decrease glucose levels, decrease depressions and increase quality of life. Um, vigorous activity, physical activity with sweating uh, shown to decrease glucose, decrease blood pressures, decrease uh, HPV1C levels, decrease lipid profile, increase physical function, decrease depression and quality of life. So this is one of the most important things. Make sure 150 minutes a week uh, of uh, moderate intensity exercise. Strengthening exercises have shown to decrease HbA1c and sugars. Uh, adequate sleep uh, with good quality sleep shown to decrease uh, sugars, decrease HbA1c, decrease lipid profile, and improve quality of life. So, uh, if someone has well controlled sugars, so you'll check HbA1c twice a year. If someone has poorly controlled sugars or you have changed their medications, you'll check it a little more frequently, once in three months or earlier, depending on the sugars. If they do not have episodes of hypoglycemia, you will maintain a target of HPMC less than 7. If someone has very poor life expectancy, the end-stage cancer, um, uh, heart, very severe heart failure on palliative care, in those cases, you will maintain a HPMC target of 8. In that case, quality of life is more important than pill burden and this thing. So you will maintain a target of 8. Okay. So just uh, this thing with... Uh, HPA1C comparison with uh, ACPC, so ACE of uh, 80 to 130, PC of uh, less than 180. These are the targets for uh, your diabetic patients. So uh, I've spoken about individualized targets, right? So um, this is the guideline, but you can individualize this based on your patients. So if someone has uh, recurrent episodes of hypoglycemia or severe drug reactions, in those cases, you will uh, have a less stringent HPMC cutoff. But if they don't have that, you can have a more stringent HPMC cutoff. If someone is newly diagnosed to have diabetes, you will have a much stringent HPMC cutoff compared to someone who's been diabetic for 40, 50 years. If your life expectancy is very low, you will rather have them at, keep them at a uh, low, uh, less stringent HPMC cutoff to prevent uh, drug, drug side effects, all the issues with the medications. Uh, if the patient is very highly motivated, uh, very uh, 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 this thing about uh, his self care, then you will have a much more stringent uh, this uh, HBMC cutoff. But someone who wants a less burdensome therapy, if you give them a very stringent this thing, they might not take any of the medications and come back with the worst. In those cases, you might actually have a less stringent HBMC cutoff compared to a more stringent. 
uh, if resource and support systems are limited, you might have a less stringent experience cutoff. If they are uh, good uh, social support system, good resources, then you might have a more stringent experience cutoff. So you have to individualize it. You cannot have a one uh, rule fits all. You will make a clinical judgment on your OPD based on all these factors. So if the patient has hypoglycemia, you'll classify them depending on the class of uh, level of hypoglycemia. Level one is between 70 to 54. Level two is 54, but without any uh, symptoms. Level three is if they have any uh, hypoglycemia with altered mental or physical uh, status requiring medical assistance. Um, if they have obesity and diabetes uh, simultaneously, you will also uh, maintain uh, target a 5% weight loss. Um, the ADA guidelines says that they need uh, behavioral therapy and counseling sessions of uh, 16 sessions in six months for weight reduction. Uh, so it is um, uh, advisable to involve a psychologist uh, for weight reduction counseling. Um, a calorie deficit of 500 to 750 calories per day. And um, those who attain this uh, weight uh, loss goals, you should not stop there. You have to make sure that they are adherent to this uh, weight loss because they can have a rebound weight gain. For those who attain this uh, weight loss goals, you keep them on long-term weight maintenance programs. Um, so other than nutritional uh, uh, physical activity and behavioral counseling, you can also use uh, pharmacotherapy and metabolic surgery. Uh, pharmacotherapy can be initiated after BMI of uh, 28. Metabolic surgery, if someone is on BMI more than 30. But this is very individualized. This cannot be uh, used for everyone uh, as there's a this thing behind treatment may be indicated for selected motivated patients not for everyone so pharmacotherapy for obesity and diabetes if you want a short term uh, uh, weight loss goals you can use uh, fentanyl uh, long term uh, uh, weight reduction you can use lipase inhibitors like orlistat uh, fentanyl vetopiramid naltrexone with bu uh, bupropion uh, or uh, you can use uh, glucagon like peptide 1 receptor antagonists like uh, liraglutide or semaglutide. Um, we've used uh, liraglutide, semaglutide, has a good anti diabetic property as well as uh, weight loss thing. Little expensive. Um, it's a, and it's a injectable. Uh, so you have to, uh, it's a weekly injection you can use um, for a mm, month, but it's, it is expensive. So when you come to uh, the main pharmacotherapy for diabetes, so the uh, new guidelines actually sp splits along with diabetes, what is your main goal? Are you trying to reduce cardiovascular uh, risk? Are you, are you going for uh, renal protection? Are you going for weight loss? Or you just want glycemic control? So depending on that, your drugs change. So if you're mainly looking for uh, someone has a high cardiovascular risk uh, with a ASCVD mm, score, a high ASCVD score, or someone who has uh, um, risk factors for developing a uh, cardiovascular disease. So in those uh, patients, along with metformin, you will either use a uh, uh, GLP-1 receptor antagonist or a SGLT-2 uh, inhibitors. So if with those also your HbA1c does not come under control, you will use the other one. If you started with GLP-1, you will add SGLT-2. If you started with SGLT-2, you will add a GLP-1 receptor antagonist. Okay. So this is for someone with a high cardiovascular risk. If someone has diabetes with heart failure, you will use um, SGLT2 inhibitors. Because those are the ones which are proven to be of benefit. If someone has CKD uh, with GFR less than uh, 60 but more than 30, in those cases, you will use SGLT2 inhibitors, which are shown to have uh, uh, reduced CKD progression. And if the HbA1c is still not under control with that, then you can add a GLP1 uh, uh, GLP receptor antagonist. So these are the uh, first two things. If someone has obesity and uh, you want uh, weight reduction with uh, diabetic control, uh, GLP-1 receptor antagonist would be uh, the drug of choice. Then other things, you, uh, metformin and uh, DPP-4 inhibitors are the other things you can use. You would usually avoid uh, 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 sorry, uh, things like a pyoglitazone, uh, which can increase the weight and fluid retention. Um, with just glycemic controls, um, the drugs with the highest, most uh, effective for glucose lowering would be your uh, insulin and your uh, GLP-1 uh, uh, receptor antagonist. 
but the ones which you would choose with high uh, glucose lowering uh, this thing would be metformin uh, sglt2 inhibitors sulfonylureas or thiazolid dpp4 uh, inhibitors have a intermediate glucose lowering effect so depending on your patient characteristics you will choose which of these uh, 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 tracks you will go by this is a crowded slide you can go through this in the document uh, itself which talks about each of those drugs what are the things you need to uh, keep in mind what, what what for each of those drugs where will you start straight away with insulin uh, so if someone has an hb1c more than 10 if they are coming with diabetic catabolism or osmotic syndrome where they have sig significant weight loss polyuria polydipsia in those uh, with affecting their activities you can start insulin straight away someone who is presenting with a diabetic ketoacidosis so you start off with insulin gestational diabetes uncontrolled on mnt <coughs> severe organ involvement and perioperative patients so um, about uh, insulin uh, there are few things to consider so if you are uh, thinking of starting an injectable regimen for the patient uh, the ada guidelines says start off first with glp1 receptor antagonists before you start insulin uh, this might not be as that practical for our patients with the cost constraints of a GLP-1 receptor antagonist. But if cost is not an issue, first start GLP-1 receptor antagonist. If the sugars still do not get controlled on that, and if your HBMC is still high, then you add insulin. So when we add insulin, first we add uh, um, short-acting ones, no? uh, uh, actropid, mom, mom, breakfast, lunch, dinner. And the AD guidelines says you start off with the basal insulin. So next thing should be a basal insulin, depending on whether it's a long-acting basal uh, uh, analog or whether you're using a bedtime NPH insulin. So you start off with either a 10 units or uh, 0.1 to 0.2 units per kg per day. You start off with a ba basal insulin. Go up on the basal insulin. If your sugars are still uncontrolled on that, that is when you go on to uh, your, um, sorry, that is when you go on to your prandial insulin. Uh, clear? Basal insulin first, then you add on prandial insulin. And then if still not controlled in that, you do a, uh, either a mix, uh, uh, pre-mixed or a split mixed uh, insulins for those and titrate according to the sugar levels. Okay. So next would be reduction of complications. Here, the four pillars of uh, this thing where you have uh, glycemic management, blood pressure management, lipid management, and um, cardiovascular and kidney benefit. <clears throat> so someone with diabetes and high blood pressure, if the BP is uh, between 140 to 160 systolic and 90 to 100 diastolic, you start off a single agent. If they have either proteinuria or uh, features of a cardiovascular risk, then you start ACRB. If not, you can also start CCB or a diuretic. If the BP is more than 160, uh, Agree, okay. you'll straight away start off with two agents. If they have one of the agents has to be an ACRB. If not, you can use any of those uh, two agents from that list. If the blood pressure uh, doesn't get controlled with that also, then you add a third agent. Um, and uh, if it doesn't get controlled with that, you add a min mineral corticoid receptor antagonist after that. And if it doesn't get controlled with that, you need to do a uh, special. Uh, 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 Evaluation for secondary hypertension in this patient. The dyslipidemia cutoffs have been lowered. I'm not very, uh, uh, I don't agree with this fully. Uh, for someone uh, between 40 to 75 years old, uh, with uh, they said uh, target uh, with uh, risk, uh, without atherosclerotic, um, LDL cholesterol 50% of baseline or LDL cholesterol goal of 70. And they have said all of them to be started on moderate intensity statin, that is 10 mg atovastat equivalent. And with uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, uh, target LDL cholesterol of 55, and these patients to be on a high dose statin, that is atovastatin 40 equivalent. This is the what the ADA guidelines says, but I think this we need to take with a pinch of salt. For someone with uh, diabetic nephropathy, um, if the uh, uh, urine albumin creatinine ratio is more than 30, you need to start them on ACRB. 
monitor the creatinine and potassium. <coughs> the guideline says if the um, if creatinine goes up by less than 30%, you don't need to start, stop the ACRB if there is no evidence of volume de depletion. So we have this tendency of if the creat jumps up, we take off the ACRB. But if it's less than 30% and there's no evidence of volume depletion, you don't need to stop the ACRB. And uh, HCLT2 inhibitors, if uh, GFR is more than 20 and albuminuria is more than 200, you can consider adding HCLT2 inhibitors. So this is just a... Um, sorry. Mm, small, uh, very clear table on uh, basically where you see that uh, refer written in those red. That is when you will involve a nephrologist also in your treatment plan. Prior to that, you can manage uh, by yourself. And uh, all patients with diabetes first visit uh, need an eye evaluation done to look for diabetic retinopathy. Uh, and if there is no evidence of diabetic retinopathy, you just need to screen them every once, one to two years. Yeah, for uh, high risk uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy and severe non proliferative diabetic retinopathy, pan retinal laser photocoagulation therapy or uh, intravitreous uh, VGF uh, uh, injections would be a reasonable alternative for that. Please remember please don't stop your aspirin if the patient has a retinal hemorrhage. Retinal hemorrhage is not a contraindication for aspirin therapy. Okay. And uh, the last uh, point diabetic neuropathy. So we'll classify it as uh, 0, 1, 2, 3. So 0 is there is no uh, loss of protective sensation, uh, no peripheral arterial uh, disease. In these patients, you do a foot examination annually. If you have loss of um, uh, protective sensation or peripheral absent peripheral pulses, peripheral arterial obstructive disease, you will do a foot examination every 6 to 12 months. If you have both, that is loss of uh, protective sensation plus peripheral arterial disease, or if you have either of those with foot deformity, you will do every three to six months foot examination. <coughs> if they have had a foot ulcer, if there is a history of amputation, if there is end stage renal disease, the foot examination has to happen every one to three months. Okay. Clear? Okay. So this is just a brief overview of what you will do for a patient who comes to you with diabetes based on the ADA 23 guidelines. There are a lot of changes which have happened. The, I remember the previous guidelines used to have uh, this thing for uh, if uh, resources are available, resources are not available. If resources are not available, it used to go into sulfonylureas and metformin. The resources are available. But this time they have taken that off for some reason. Um, these are the guidelines, but I, your patients who come to you in OPD, you have to bring in your individualized. You can't. Um, give someone GLP-1 receptor antagonists who can't even afford to travel, uh, finds it difficult to even tra can't travel and come to the hospital. Those are the things you need to keep in mind. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay. okay. Sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, for metformin for prevention, uh, you mentioned some three things. So, BMI more than 35, HPLC is more than 6.0 and fasting more than 1. All three should be there, or any one we have to start. Sorry, which one? One minute, I'll just see. Yeah, yeah prevent all three, all three. All three should be. Yeah. There. So if you have uh, someone, uh, someone say BMI of twenty, who's come with a fasting glucose of one twenty five, you will not start metformin on them. So you need uh, um, either a fasting or HPMC. Either of those you can do, but they need a BMI of more than thirty five. Yeah, not all. Uh, yeah, understood that. No. So someone who's uh, overweight, obese, uh, with a high fasting glucose uh, um, or a high HPMC, you will start metformin. Um, any diabetic who's coming with, say, uh, LDL of 100, uh, we don't have to calculate the ACVD. We need to calculate AS. What they are saying is if the ACVD score is low, you start statins at low dose. If it's high, you start at 40 mg of whatever statin equivalent, which I am I don't fully agree with. No, actually, what can we do? Sir? Yeah, we can start them on lifestyle management, uh, weight reduction, uh, give a trial of weight reduction, this thing. If they are, uh, LDL is still high on that, then you will start off on statins. So the target will keep us what, the 70? 70. 70. So if it's not working out in like six months or one year of... Uh, six months, yeah. Uh, diet and lifestyle, then we you start, start statins with a high ASVD score. 
If it's a high, if it's not high, then you don't. But know. here they're saying uh, if, if it's care, a yeah. low risk, you start. Yes. Okay. Thank you.